uh, Microsoft Azure team. Docker, great experience on Azure. I uh, worked with the Visual Studio guys because they're building plugins. Uh, I worked with the SQL Server team uh, because they're re actually releasing um, Microsoft SQL Server Docker images um, and, and other people at Microsoft. Um, but yeah, so back, back to the stuff I'll, I'll talk about tonight, um, which, is, uh, which is Docker on Windows Server. So since you probably know Docker pretty well, like you probably know that Docker used to be a, uh, a kind of Linux only, uh, Linux only technology uh, because Docker orchestrates uh, uh, primitives that are available in the Linux kernel, like uh, C groups and namespaces. Um, so um, what happened was that uh, a couple of years ago in 2014, um, Microsoft was looking at um, Linux containers and they kind of wanted something similar for Windows. Um, and uh, to our mutual fortune, they decided that uh, they wanted to collaborate with uh, Docker to make that happen. Um, so in the previous two years, uh, the Windows kernel team at Microsoft has basically been adding uh, containerization primitives to the Windows kernel. And then uh, Microsoft and Docker together have worked on porting, porting the Docker engine to, uh, to Windows. And that's both the core engine, but also all the CLIs, Docker Compose, uh, all the other software that kind of forms, uh, forms the Docker platform. Uh, and that was, uh, so the Windows kernel work is, uh, is proprietary, of course, but um, uh, uh, Docker engine work was done in the open. So if you go look at uh, the Docker Docker repo right now, you can see there's a bunch of Microsoft employees that are actually uh, contributors to, uh, to Docker engine. Um, and there's even, uh, uh, one of them was even elevated to a maintainer. So uh, John, John Howard is a, is a Docker engine maintainer. Um, yeah, and then kind of in, in parallel to the work on the core engine, uh, we've been working to make sure that all, all the other services that you use, if you use Docker, like Docker Hub or the registry, um, are what we call multi-arc aware, which means that you can store Windows and Docker images uh, and all sorts of other images also actually uh, on, on Docker Hub and in the registry. Um, and, and it's a good experience. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of uh, the, the, flow, the flow we're looking to build uh, for, for, for Windows containers. Um, so like starting all, all the way on the right, left, I guess, um, with Visual Studio. Um, so the Visual Studio team is building uh, tools for Docker so that you can build uh, containerized apps with Visual Studio. Then we made sure that the registry and Docker Hub supports Windows images, so that you can push and pull images and share them with your friends and colleagues. Uh, um, and then uh, we ported the Docker engine to Windows Server so that you can run, run those container images um, for development or, or in production, either on-prem on your, on your Windows Server 2016 instances or, or in Azure. Um, yeah. So and kind of the, the significance of this for Docker, right, is that Docker used to be a, a Linux-only technology, but now um, Docker tools also work really, really great for Windows developers and on, on uh, Windows servers. So um, it, basically, we, we, you can now use Docker to manage both uh, Windows and Linux workloads, which means that Docker is kind of applicable to almost all, uh, all uh, enterprise, uh, all enterprise uh, workloads. Um, so I'll, I'll do a bunch of demos later, but I'll just run through some of the some of the technical details. Um, so with you know how on on uh, when you're building Linux Docker images, you can start from scratch, which is just an, an empty Linux user land, or you can start from a kind of pre-made uh, base images like Debian or Alpine, or Ubuntu. Um, so it's a little bit different on Windows. Um, it's, not, it's not possible to start from scratch, so you can't start with an empty, uh, a completely empty file system. You have two choices, either Windows Server Core or, or Nano Server. Uh, so Windows Server Core is, um, I don't know how many of you guys use uh, Windows Server regularly, but it's essentially like if you take the Windows Server ISO and you install it, then uh, like you have a kind of clean, clean Windows install. Um, that, that's what Windows Server Core represents. Uh, but there's no running GUI, uh, so you can only do kind of um, yeah, ser uh, server-side back backend apps. Um, so, but because the Windows Server Core uh, image is like, it represents a complete Windows user land, you 
almost any kind of server-side app that you could make run on a normal um, Windows server install, you can, all, you can make that run in a Windows server container. So if you need to run IIS or SQL Server or the full .NET framework, all of those install and work great in a, in a Windows Server core-based uh, Windows container. Uh, so the downside to that is that it's a little bit bulky. Um, so the download is a couple of gigabytes and expanded on the file system, it's, it's even larger. Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of a downer, but um, in practice, it's, it's, it's not a huge problem uh, because Docker's pretty smart about the layering. So like once you have that Windows Server core base layer, once you've gotten that once, or either on your development machine or your doc, on your production host, then typically all of your other containers will just uh, they'll all be built on top of that image, and because of the Docker image uh, layer sharing, um, uh, they just share that that one uh, base layer. Uh, so it's not it's not too bad in practice. Um, the other option is uh, called Nano Server. Uh, so Nano Server is a new variant of um, of Windows that Microsoft started shipping with. Um, uh, Windows Server 2016. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, if you didn't realize, like t today was actually the day that uh, Windows Server 2016 went GA, um, and they announced it a couple of weeks ago. So it's been available for a few weeks. Um, but so with Windows Server 2016, there's now a new variant of Windows Server called uh, called Nano Server, which is um, a very stripped down uh, Windows version. So there's no GUI at all, um, and they just kind of ripped out uh, everything that they that they didn't want. Um, so the good thing about that is that it's way smaller. It's only a couple of hundred megabytes. I think the download is uh, 200 megabytes. Um, um, and and like there's, there's, I, there's two reasons to get excited about Nano Server. Actually, it's both both as a um, as a kind of container host. So you can think of a Nano Server kind of like uh, Call OS or like other min very minimal uh, uh, minimal. Um, uh, operating systems that are optimized for running containers. Uh, the, the same with Nano Server. It's, it's very small, it doesn't require a lot of updates, and the security service area is, uh, is minimal. Uh, and then the other reason to get excited about it is as a, as a base layer for, uh, for Windows containers, uh, just because it's a smaller and more nimble, nimble um, um, starting point for, for your Windows containers. The downside is that it doesn't have the full classic uh, Windows uh, user land or the uh, API, so it doesn't have all the DLLs and, and whatnot that that that's in Windows Server Core. Uh, so, for example, the full .NET framework won't run, um, but the new .NET Core framework does run in Nano Server, and so does uh, IIS. And uh, <coughs> Microsoft is busy uh, porting more software. I'll I'll show you details of all this in a bit. Um, so another interesting aspect of Windows Server 2016 is um, is two runtime isolation op options. Um, and the way the way to think about that is it's kind of like seccomp profiles uh, and, and, and kind of the other uh, ways you can lock down containers running running on Linux. But, so on Windows, there's two, uh, two, two isolation choices. There's Windows Server Containers, which is um, similar to, to Linux, where you have a shared kernel, and the kernel is shared between both normal user land processes and all the container processes running on the system. The other mode is uh, Hyper-V Containers. So yeah, there's a better, better graph in a little bit. Uh, with Hyper-V containers, uh, when you start a um, Hyper-V container, uh, the Docker engine actually starts a very thin hypervisor. Um, and then there's a minimal uh, Windows kernel running on top of that uh, hypervisor, and then the container image is placed inside of, uh, inside of that hypervisor um, and, and is uh, executing inside of there. The good thing is that like one a single Docker image, um, Windows Docker image can be deployed either as a, as a Windows Server container or as a Hyper-V container. So as a de developer, you don't really have to worry about it. But if you are in operations and you feel that you need uh, great isolation for one reason or another, um, Hyper-V containers are an option for you. Or maybe you have regulatory requ requirements that means that you have to isolate your code, um, a running, uh, running code with, uh, with an actual hypervisor, which exists. Um, then, then you have the, the Hyper-V option. Uh, this, this shows this in uh, slightly more detail. So um, this, this shows uh, like a Windows Server container. So you can see it's running on a kernel, a Windows kernel that's shared with other processes on, on the host system. And then over here, there's a, a Hyper-V container, um, which 
runs on top of a hypervisor with its own little Windows kernel, and then the, the container process is, is running inside of there. Uh, and you can you can mix and match, and you can have as many as uh, of each as you want on, on any, given, any given system. Yeah, just to compare uh, the OS architectures. Um, so if you know Docker and Linux, you probably know these primitives, like the, the stuff that makes Docker work on Linux, control groups, namespaces, um, and layered file systems. Uh, when implementing containers, Microsoft went and implemented similar concepts on Windows. So you have job objects, object namespaces, and then spend a ton of time um, building uh, layering into NTFS, the Windows file system. And also, uh, like it's kind of funny actually, like the, on Linux, everything, all the, all the state is in, in, is in the file system, but, but on Windows, you have both the file system, but also the registry. Um, so they had to build layering into the into the Windows registry so that your container process can, can write to the registry uh, without affecting one another. Uh, and by the way, I'm happy to take, what, what's best to take questions uh, during or, or after? After. Okay, cool. Okay, so just hold on to your questions and I'll, I'll answer them after. Okay, so um, how do you actually get to run Windows containers. Um, so, Windows containers are a feature of Windows Server 2016. Uh, so, the new uh, Windows Server 2016 kernel, the containerization, containerization primitives are there, and you can run the Docker engine on top of that. But actually, Microsoft slipped the same kernel updates into Windows 10. So, if you did the anniversary update, which came out a couple of months ago, then um, uh, Docker Engine runs directly on Windows 10, and you can start and stop containers on Windows 10 directly. So, if you just want to do development, uh, that's that's a pretty good model to get to get uh, set up easy. Um, and so, if you install Docker for Windows, or if you install the public beta version of that, um, we already set up both kind of the normal Linux uh, Docker Engine running inside of Mobi in a VM, but we also install a um, uh, we also install a, a Windows uh, Engine. Uh, so it's kind of small, but you can see I'm running the I'm running the beta version here. So I get this toggle where I can switch between Linux and Windows containers uh, on my system. And that basically just switches out the, the endpoint of the of the main pipe that the Docker CLI talks to. Um, so that's 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 the easiest way to get set up. Like just run Docker Engine on Windows 10. Uh, Alternatively, if you plan to do a lot of development, uh, it might be worth it to set up a Windows Server 2016 instance in a VM, so that's that's what I'm going to be showing in a little bit. Then also, uh, the images are available on Azure, so you can just get started there. It's pretty easy to set up. Uh, if you're on Mac OS or Linux or an older Windows version, um, you can install Windows Server 2016 in a, in a VM, in VirtualBox or VMware, whatever approach you vote. Um, so actually, uh, that's, and that's a free trial. So if you are otherwise an open source um, person, but you just want to try this out, um, you can just download it for free and, uh, and set it up, and it's free for 180 days. Um, yeah, and this shows how to, how to install Docker Daemon on, um, on Windows uh, if you're setting up a Windows Server 2016 um, machine. And this blog post that I wrote a couple of weeks ago goes through all these scenarios in greater detail. And just as an aside, like if you are interested in running Windows uh, Windows Server containers in production, then uh, part of the launch that we did with Microsoft, um, there's a commercial relationship also. So if you if you buy support for Windows Server 2016, you also get support for the Docker engine that you install there. That you install there. And you can call Microsoft support, and they'll try to help you with Docker. And if they can't figure it out, they'll escalate to us. And we can escalate back to the Windows kernel team if we can't figure it out either. Um, so yeah, just so you know. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll try to do some demos. Um, this, this font is too small. Read. Okay. 
Um, so on, on, this, uh, on this system, uh, you can see when I do Docker version, um, my CLI is Windows, no big surprise. Uh, but my, uh, my server is actually also running, running on a Windows machine. And in this case, um, so that could be the, the Docker daemon running directly on, on Windows. But in this case, I set up a Windows Server 2016 RTM in, in Hyper-V. And then I just uh, set my uh, Docker host. Uh, I set my Docker host like this, and then uh, basically my this, this, my Docker CLI on Windows 10 is just talking to the Docker engine running inside of Windows Server 2016. Um, then I don't have to install editors and all this other stuff in, inside of the VM. This, uh, this, this is what I, what I find easiest, but you can do whatever. Um, all right, so uh, I can do Docker images, and it's going to be weirdly formative because it's not 80 characters. Um, but you can see some of the images I have. So uh, I have Microsoft Nano Server, so that's the base image for Nano Server, and I have uh, Microsoft Windows Server Core, that's the um, uh, base Im image for Windows Server. You can see unpacked on the file system there, and non-trivial in size. Uh, and these these images are published by Microsoft uh, on Docker Hub, so you basically just Docker pull them, and then then they're there. Um, so it's big big Euler and everything. Um, all right, so let's try to run one of these guys. I can do docker run dash ti. So, more shell. Um, so with this, um, Docker will start a nano server container, and I'm now inside of a, my own little uh, isolated environment, exactly as if you had run uh, docker run dash ti ubuntu bash. Um, so I can do... Uh, uh, text file, um, and then I can go start another um, container. This, and if I do dir here, um, that, there's no tech, text file. So like, it works exactly the same as on Linux. The process is isolated. The file, system, file systems of the containers are, are isolated. Uh, I can blow up the registry in this container. It's not going to affect the host system or um, or the other containers running on the system. I can do Docker PS uh, to see that I have uh, one um, one guy running. Is it that one? Yes, and it's all gone. Um, let's just give you an idea of the basics. Um, let's see. Like, Basically, uh, almost all of the Docker uh, control API that you know from, from Linux works with Windows containers, so exec, logs, um, uh, port mapping, port uh, exposing ports, uh, all this stuff is fine. Um, um, so, and also, uh, Do Docker build also has uh, the same semantics. So, um, in this case, I have a very, uh, a very simple, share screen. Um, I have a very simple Docker file. So you can see I start from nano server, and then I run um, uh, set the command so I can do a dot build. Build this, so I can do dot run i, and it should print to the console. Um, so that, that works too. And if I do docker images, it should be an i, just right there. Um, make sense? Um, so, next up, I, uh, I'd like to show a more uh, complicated example. Um, oh, wait, actually, I want to I wanna show some of the differences between uh, a nano server and Windows Server Core, uh, just to give you an idea of, of, of the differences. So, you can already see that they, the images are, are very different in size, by an order of magnitude, actually. Uh, but if I do, uh, if I run nano server one again, I can do get process, and you can see, so Windows is also a little weird in this regard. Like, you know, on Linux, when you start a container, um, it's based, the only process that's running is the container process. Um, just by the word, by the nature of Windows, uh, um, like to have a functioning uh, Windows system, you have to have a, a few, a few um, processes running, and this is kind of the minimal, minimal subset that they could uh, get to. Um, let me just try running a, a Windows Server Core one. 
So we can do, so this, is, this container is now running the kind of more heavyweight um, uh, version of, of Windows. So I can do get process. Uh, okay, uh, it's actually a similar, similar setup. Uh, exactly the same. Okay, I actually thought there was gonna be more in the Windows Server Core one, but it's not. Well, we can do another thing. So this was in uh, Windows Server Core. So this is basically how to do uh, vc-l, like how many items are in that directory. Uh, so you can see in the system32 directory, there's um, almost 2,000 files. Um, so that's a bunch of DLLs and all the other stuff that goes into Windows. As we can do the same same command on the, in the nano server container. It's only 522 objects, just to give you an idea of it's way more minimal Linux, but there's also a bunch of uh, bunch of stuff missing. If if you have a if you have an app that expects a full full Windows install, it's it's it might not work. Um, so that's the microfrisk measure of Windows complexity. All right. Um, yeah, if you see my terminal being weird, uh, it's partly because I run conemu, uh, which uh, sometimes interacts back badly with, uh, with Docker, uh, Docker shells. Um, anyway, uh, on to the more kind of complex example. So um, this app is, it's an app called Music Store. It's um, kind of sp.net MVC web app uh, that uses a database, um, as a SQL Server database actually, and um, uh, uh, so you, you gotta run two containers and they gotta work in, in concert to, uh, to make this app run. Um, let's see, I have it here. Um, so, um, so for the launch, uh, I went and uh, containerized this app um, and made it run in um, in uh, Windows containers. So to do that, I had to add uh, I had to add two uh, two files to the project: a, a Docker file and a Docker Compose file. So like very similar to what you what you do on on Linux. And like this, calling it dot Windows is uh, just a random convention that's uh, that is also used for Docker actually. Um, so you can see uh, the the Docker file is uh, similar to what you'd see on Linux. You start from in this case from Microsoft.net. Um, so as I mentioned, we made Docker Hub also stores Windows uh, Windows images, um, and uh, we maintain some uh, Windows images already. You can actually show that also. Uh, I can run uh, Golang, for example. Uh, for Golang, uh, for, for Golang, we have official Docker library images uh, uh, based on Windows. Oops. Um, so I can get a Golang container going and do version. Um, so this is inside of a container. Uh, so if you're interested in starting to build Windows, uh, Windows containerized Windows apps, this some amount of base images uh, already available, so you don't have to start all the way from uh, from uh, uh, spare windows. Uh, so this is another one of those. Uh, it's one that Microsoft maintains, and it has .NET in it. Um, so then, actually, for for Windows, we added a new um, we added a new instruction to uh, to the Docker file syntax called shell. So um, it's a way for the Docker file author to set the shell that you want the rest of the commands in this Docker file executed with. Um, the default shell on Windows is uh, cmp.exe, so like think ms dos 62 from, <laughs> from the late 80s. Um, so this is a way to get around that, like you say, you say, hey, please execute the rest of these commands with PowerShell. Um, um, and then I just do similar stuff as I would on Linux. I create a directory for myself. Then I copy in project.json file, which is um, it's like uh, requirements that requirements that txt for a node or a, bond, a gem file uh, with Ruby. And then I run .NET restore to fetch all the NuGet packages. Um, then I add in the rest of the app, and then I can run .NET build. Finally, I expose the port um, 
and set some environment, and then I can run .NET run to actually stand up uh, stand up the .NET app. Um, so I can go back here. Uh, we also show you the compose file. Uh, so again, very similar to uh, to Linux. Uh, I have two services. The database the database is just based off of um, another image that Microsoft publishes uh, with uh, SQL Server 2016 Express in it. Then I have a web service uh, where I just build the Docker file that I just showed you. Um, so I can run that. So I'll do Docker Compose. Uh, excuse me, build actually. Um, so I'll just do a Docker Compose build. So the, the date DB image doesn't have to get built, but um, you can build um, uh, the web uh, the web container. And I'd already uh, built it, so it was pretty fast. So again, kind of ca the caching semantics works the same on Windows as on Linux. Then I can do up. So, uh, so first uh, database gets created, and then um, container running the web service gets created, and networking also works on Windows. It was, it was hard, but they made it work. Um, and with that, it's up. Find the IP. Open the sky. Awesome. Um, app should come up. Also connect to SQL Server. So this is the app running inside of Windows container. Um, this is like a CRUD app. I could log in and whatnot. And you can see, um, you can see the uh, database got created. So this is uh, SQL Server Management Studio. It's kind of the default GUI that you use for managing uh, SQL Server. Um, yeah, so, so that worked. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if there are other interesting lessons to be had from this. So, like, in itself, the, um, it, the the magnitude of having SQL Server run like this to me is uh, is pretty uh, is pretty amazing. I spent a lot of time in previous lives uh, installing ad and administering SQL Server databases, and it's um, it's really like a big piece of software that's hard to to manage. But um, with this, I mean, you can just uh, spin up completely new, fresh. SQL Server instances, like there's no tomorrow. Um, Docker run, um, so there's one, there's another one. Like usually this would take me half a day to even get one of these going, right? Um, and now with Docker, I can just run them uh, run them in, uh, in containers. Um, and there, there they all are. Uh, and if one of my colleagues went in and did something stupid with one of them, uh, just tear it down, and nobody, nobody would care, and I'd start another one. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, you had a you had a question. Wait. Oh. Hello. Whoa. <laughs> um, so all of those SQL servers comes with its own GUI. No. So the way this works, right, is that SQL Server is just running headless inside of a Docker container. And then I'm kind of connecting with this management tool from outside. Uh, then I'm connecting to, uh, to the SQL Server instance that, that I'm running. Yeah. Oh, we just need to get you there. Oh, I was just gonna ask, what are the uh, uh, other things that you can run besides SQL Server? Like yeah. IIS and... Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so definitely, uh, you can run SQL Server, and then kind of in, in Nano Server, you can run .NET Core and Go. Go also works in Nano Server, um, and a couple other pieces of software. Uh, but then in Windows Server Core, in a Windows Server Core-based image, there's uh, like as long as you don't require a GUI, uh, you're going to be fine. You, you can you can install software and make it run um, uh, on on Windows Server Core. So like IIS, um, the full .NET framework, um, Node. Uh, Mongo, MySQL, all of those run great uh, on um, on Windows Server Core. 
not have been right. If I'm running a container and I kill the container, can I kill it without losing my data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you, can, you can stop a container and then the container is still gonna be there and, um, and you can kind of save it or export the data and, or start it again. And then the other thing you can do, uh, like what people typically do with Linux, and that works on Windows also, is that you just kind of uh, mount a volume from the host into the container. So for example, if I wanted to be more, do a better job with, my, with uh, this um, uh, SQL Server database, I just kind of mount, uh, uh, mount a directory from my host into the SQL Server container. And then even if that container goes away, all the changes is, it made are still on the host. And then if, you'd, if you wanted to do that for production, you'd make sure that that directory was like mapped to a storage array or uh, some sort of network share that was, that was du uh, durable, right? I have two questions. Uh, first, for the um, for the registry, uh, did you have to modify significantly modify the API to support Windows? Uh, I'm just wondering when we should expect uh, third-party registries to catch up with this right. functionality. Yeah. So actually, um, the work to the registry was done. I think most of it predates Windows because people were interested in making uh, the registry multi-arc aware because they wanted to store ARM images or images for FreeBSD. Or Solaris and all the all these other there's all these other instances where it's uh, nice to be able to have um, images for different CPU architectures side by side. Um, so for Windows, we just kind of piggyback on piggybacked on that. So I mean, as long if if your third party registry of choice is based on the open source Docker distribution source code, uh, they just have like they literally have to take in a version from a year ago or something, and and that that would still work and have multi support. Okay. Uh, second one. Uh, uh, as far as uh, combining Windows and Linux containers, so I understand you cannot combine them on the same host at this point. At this point, uh, but uh, with the, within Docker Swarm, for instance, is Docker Swarm supported? Can Linux and Windows containers talk to each other, share volumes? Yep. Uh, yeah. So right now, um, this is something that we're working very hard on, uh, which is another way to say that it doesn't work right now. Um, so, uh, well, so actually. Um, this was demoed at DockerCon. Like you can have a Linux and a, Win a Windows host, and with kind of Swarm One, uh, they they can be in the same swarm, but uh, overlay networking between them doesn't work yet. Um, uh, but yeah, that that like that basic just kind of running in the same swarm side by side works. But so we're working very hard with Microsoft to make uh, to make overlay networking work. Um, yeah. Okay, and um, Docker Compose work, can combine multiple containers, um, multiple architectures. In the same file? Docker Compose is a little funky in that regard because um, generally when you do Docker Compose up, you're actually just targeting one host. So Docker Compose interaction, at least with the new swarm mode, is, is not always ideal. Um, but so like once we get all this stuff working, um, then uh, yes, that, that'll work. Like you'll properly create, create a DAP file and then, uh, then you deploy the DAP file and then the primitive that's used to, dis to, to schedule containers on either Linux or Windows is uh, it's scheduling constraints. So it, that's using a primitive that's already there. Like people will label their nodes to say, oh, this one has SSDs, this one doesn't have SSDs. And so Docker already, already has uh, scheduling constraints that let you say this particular container is supposed to be running on a node with SSDs, and, and you can use the same primitives for, for deciding whether containers run on Windows or Linux. Oh. Uh, I'll ask more, more okay. questions later. So, so I think, I, actually, I'll just uh, go through the rest of the presentation, and then, then I'll take take some more uh, questions. So I just wanted to, so so that that's the content I had for Windows containers. Uh, so we're doing other stuff with Microsoft, including Docker for Azure, which right now is Linux only, uh, but we're, um, we'll be adding uh, Windows support. Uh, but so Docker for Azure is a really simple way to set up um, Docker 112 on Azure, and you get kind of full swarm mode, and we integrate with Azure load balancing to make it a, a really great experience. Um, and we also, if you're interested in Docker data center, there's uh, um, kind of easy to try templates on, on Azure. And some of the other work we do is uh, with the .NET team, both to make the full .NET framework work well in Windows containers and to make .NET Core work really great in both Linux and Windows containers. So, so the container used the .NET uh, app I just ran was based on a uh, Docker image that Microsoft maintains and publishes. 
um, and you saw SQL Server, so we're working with the SQL Server team. And actually, um, if any of you are in the private beta for SQL Server on Linux, uh, which is a thing, uh, then uh, one of the ways they let you try that out is uh, by giving you a Linux uh, Docker image to, to run a SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server on Linux. And it's, it's just really neat. Um, and then the Visual Studio tooling, which I, I didn't demo tonight, but if you're using Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, there's uh, good, good plugins for uh, developing with Docker. Um, yeah, kind of next steps, um, you can go to docker.com slash Microsoft and there's a bunch of blog posts that I and other, others have, have written, uh, starting, going through the same content I, I went through today. And there's also a bunch of great people in the community, uh, Alex Ellis, uh, Elton Stoneman and Stephen Scherer are all uh, Docker captains and they're working and, and they're building kind of uh, samples and, and base images based on Windows. Um, so check, check out their work. And then you all, please always just feel free to uh, uh, tweet at me or send me emails and I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions. And I'll also be ha happy to answer questions now. I have two questions. One, do you know if uh, any of the other orchestration frameworks are looking into supporting this? Yes, uh, the Kubernetes uh, is uh, definitely looking looking at it. Um, so uh, if you're interested in Kubernetes, they have a Windows uh, special interest group. So the Kubernetes work is uh, organized into special interest group and there's one for Windows. They meet every other week, Tuesday at 10 a.m. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the Mesos guys are also working on it, uh, but uh, it's, I don't think they're as far as long as, uh, as either Docker or... Do you Docker. know if the rancher guys are at all? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he definitely, he was looking at it. I saw, uh, I saw it on Twitter. So I, I think uh, one of their big customers is interested. Okay. He's talking at it. Great. The, the second one is, you know, with Docker, there's generally this philosophy of one process per container. Is that still going to maintain true with Windows, or is you going to kind of diverge from that a little bit? Yeah, well, so te technically there will be more processes running in there, but, uh, but those are just kind of the, the nature of Windows right. processes, right? So I think the, the way you should architect your Windows containers should follow the kind of uh, Linux dogma. It's just easier to reason about. Uh, mm -hmm. And also because the containers are so lightweight, it's easy to split them out. Like, so it, you, you could have, I could have made the sample so that SQL Server and the .NET app runs in the same container, right. but it's kind of, it's, it's not the point, right? So, uh, so yeah, uh, yes, yeah, split them out, I'd say, unless you have some sort of barnacle legacy app that you desperately want to, uh, to put into a container, then might, it might make sense to, to, uh, to not have, um, to not try to split it out. Got it. One last one is, how about logging? Because Windows uses the event viewer and that could be kind of a mess in Docker log. What are you guys doing yeah. about that? So Docker logs works the same. So if, you're, um, if your container prints the standard out, then it goes into the usual uh, Docker logging pipeline. Uh, but that's, a, that's yeah, some, somebody has to do a good sample of that also because, um, for example, SQL Server uh, will not log the standard out uh, <laughs> by nature. Uh, it'll it'll um, write to the event, uh, event log. Um, uh, so you can, so I think basically it's going to be um, something where um, you, you start whatever software you want to run, SQL Server, um, and then uh, you start that in the background, and then you start tailing, you start uh, writing that uh, software's event log to uh, stand it out, because that'll then feed into a Docker, but um, <laughs> there's no, uh, there's no uh, PowerShell event log tail command. Uh, right now, so, uh, so that, that has to be scripted. Yeah, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, well, yeah, it's interesting for the Windows guys because like, people like you or me, uh, we want it standard out and part of their Windows logs, but on the Windows side, there's a lot of people, that they think about it the other way. Oh, how can, how can I get all this uh, Docker stuff into my uh, Windows event log because that's where all of the rest of my logging pipeline. Um, but yeah, some, somebody needs to write good samples. Question though. Yep. Slightly different topic, but for continuous delivery pipelines, would you need both Linux and Windows, and would you need Docker Hub, private sort of Docker Hub executing? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, fundamentally to build 
a Windows container, you need a Windows kernel. Um, so yes, you, you, you will kind of need two sets of systems. Um, so hopefully Docker Hub will, um, so doc, we, we can't do auto builds for Docker, uh, for Windows and Docker Hub quite yet, but uh, that, that'll be coming. And then hopefully Docker can help you, can help you manage that. But yeah, for right now, you, you're gonna have to, uh, to have two separate sets of systems. So in terms of the repos, um, what, what multi-arc support means is that um, you can actually have, like in the same repo, like if nothing else, you can just have different tags, I can show you um, what that looks like. This is the Golang repo, for example. Like this, there was already a bunch of CRUD in here, but now there's more CRUD because there's, there's basically tags for Windows Server Core, and hopefully tomorrow they'll also be for Nano Server. Uh, so that's one way to manage it. But there's a more elegant way, which is the, the kind of true multi-arc support, where actually for, for, for any given tag, a particular tag can have, um, uh, can have multi, uh, multiple architectures within it. So I wrote a blog post about this um, in the spring. Um, and the way it works is that, and this is kind of going back to the changes to the registry uh, that, that you asked about. Um, the, the way it works is that, um, uh, the registry has support for what's called uh, uh, FAT manifests. So with the FAT manifest, um, is, uh, it, it's an image manifest that contains within it uh, sub-manifests. So basically, had, had we gone to the trouble, which we will do, had we gone to the trouble of making this multi-arc, then when you do docker pull golang, the uh, registry will serve you a FAT manifest, uh, which has uh, sub-manifests for both uh, Windows and Linux. And then your Docker engine will say, oh, I'm a Windows Docker engine, so I'm gonna go grab the layers for the Windows one, um, and vice versa on, on Linux. Uh, the, the tooling is pretty rough right now, so we haven't, uh, we haven't done, done that fully, but it'll be coming. What's the state of VXLAN on Azure? And what's the state of VXLAN uh, running Windows images on things like AWS? It's, uh, I don't, it's not something uh, that, I'm, that I know anything about, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know if anyone else in the room. Uh, do, do you know the answer? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, could I ask you to send, uh, send me an email and I'll, uh, I'll uh, follow up? Yeah, sorry. So if I was doing a greenfield.net application, why should I choose this over, say, Service Fabric? Uh, well, I don't know. I think I, I haven't actually tried Service Fabric, but definitely with Service Fabric, you're going to be locked into Microsoft technology. Uh, so it's kind of like choosing to program for a, a platform as a service. Um, it, it will have to, it, your app will have to run on top of uh, a piece of software that, that Microsoft controls. Uh, if you target uh, Docker containers. Um, there's other implementations of, of container if you if you don't like Docker and and even then Docker is open source so, so you can just grab our source code and compile it and, and run run your containerized app uh, wherever you want. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Uh, other questions? Uh, you, I can just get you the mic. Does this work? I understand it's a terrible, terrible question to ask, but are you ever planning to support UI within a container? Um, we have some use cases like, you know, the, we do a lot of rendering and GPU rendering currently uh, cannot work without a UI session. Yeah. In the current versions of Windows. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so actually the early tech previews of Windows Server, uh, remote desktop uh, worked and you could, you could kind of remote desktop into a, a Windows container. Um, I think um, Microsoft just decided to disable it uh, to avoid confusion and kind of narrow down the use case. Um, but in Windows Server Core, like I'm sure all the DLLs are there, and the, it's a full Windows. They just uh, they're just not running the remote desktop daemon. Um, so yeah, maybe it will come later. But uh, it's it's kind of up to Microsoft if it's something that they want to enable. And uh, regarding Rancher, I just uh, happened to ask them a couple of days ago. They're planning a Windows release, a Windows support for 1.3. That's due to GA release in December, and they'll be doing pre-release before that. 
And uh, by the way, I'm running a Rancher user group meetup. Uh, so if you're interested in Rancher, talk to me uh, because we're uh, going to host an event in San Francisco in uh, November with Rancher. Very cool. More questions? Window admins loves uh, all the best scripting versus the Docker or more the best site. So how does people are administrative people feel comfortable work, work with uh, those Linux command? Is there any way that some sort of translator will work or there will be some sort of boost uh, flavor Docker will come up or something like that? Yeah. So. Yeah, so I mean, the default experience and, and what I showed is, uh, is just to use the Docker CLI, but Microsoft actually also, uh, they went and implemented something called uh, PowerShell for Docker. So um, it's just to set up PowerShell commandlets that target the same Docker engine API that the Docker CLI is using. So if you really like PowerShell, um, uh, then, uh, then you can use uh, those commandlets to, uh, to build and run and manage uh, containers. Then also, if you prefer a GUI, then, uh, we build Docker Data Center, obviously, so that kind of gives you a graphical uh, GUI with uh, user management and RPAC and ties into your Active Directory and all that stuff. Does that answer your question? All right. Was that the last question? Great. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>